We have an outstanding speaker, but before I introduce him, I want to take just a minute to say a huge thank you to uh, Amy and Steve Volkers and Lisa and Bill Rasner for the outstanding job they've done organizing forum speakers this year. Um, I think you'll remember that there was a theme to these forums this year. It was, we were made for these times based on uh, a piece that was written by an American poet, Clarissa Pincola Estes, and the theme of that piece was that in dark times like these, we were made to react and to act and to become engaged, and it's through those actions that things start to change. And all this fall, we carried on what we started with the Vision Forum last year. We raised our consciousness about issues, and we learned about ways we can get involved to make a difference. And just to remember, we talked about the Holy Land and the Palestinian situation there with the United Palestinian Appeal and with New Story Leadership. We talked about millennials, how we can engage them in the life of the church and faith and action. Uh, we talked about college and making more equitable opportunities for everyone in college. We heard from Jamie Raskin, our congressman, and we heard from Ray Suarez about issues with respect to people's affiliation in the church and civil discourse in the public square. These are all incredibly illuminating opportunities for us, and they help us figure out our focus on what we can do to make a difference. And against that back backdrop, the speaker we have today is really uh, the quintessential uh, example of social activism. Paul Tiao is a lawyer who works in the cybersecurity area with a big law firm, but he is a social activist and pursues social justice in just about every area of his life. Um, he's worked as uh, an organizer with the, and, a, and a lawyer with the Civil Defense Fund of the NAACP. He had 15 years of the Department of Justice starting in the Civil Rights Division. He worked with the FBI with Robert Mueller for four years as a senior counsel. He's worked in Nigeria on refugee issues. Uh, he's worked in organizing the American, Asian American um, community to get more politically active and engaged, which is a, something dear to my heart. I spent years in Asia. So Paul has done many, many things to advance the cause of social justice and civil rights. But what I found most interesting in, in preparing for the session with him was where he got this motivation. Where did it come from? His parents immigrated from China to escape Mao's regime and through Taiwan came to Madison, Wisconsin, where he grew up in an environment where his parents were always looking for what needs to be done in changing times to solve social problems, what can we do about it, and then how do we do it? And that was the environment he grew up in, and his life now exemplifies that kind of an approach. So Paul has uh, founded, co-founded, and is now the president of the organization we're going to hear about today, which is Communities United Against Hate. Communities United is a very important term, we'll talk more about that. And the purpose of this group is to bring together the many, many, many organizations who are all working more or less in isolation and on their own to address issues related to hate and divisiveness and bigotry. And by bringing them together, they reinforce each other, they create a real community, and they, very importantly, that organization, that network, offers you a direct line into opportunities to get engaged now and have an immediate impact. So this, the focus of this presentation is on what we can do. And in that sense, it's really a great way to wrap up it's really two falls of presentations on social justice. So Paul, I would like to invite you to do your presentation. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the incredibly kind introduction. Um, thanks, Lisa uh, and Bill, for inviting me to speak, and thank you all very much for being here today. Um, it is, uh, it's almost sort of embarrassing to be sort of following in the footsteps of Ray Suarez and Jamie Raskin, and I, I, I thought Lisa's email to me was a mistake, but um, I should have told her that before today. But, <laughs> so, but it's really an honor to be here, and I'm really... I'm sort of amazed at what you're all doing. I'm, I'm actually at a church right down the street at the Chevy Chase United Methodist Church across from the 4-H Club on Connecticut Avenue, and I'm the chair of our Missions and Social Concerns Committee, and what I'm realizing is that I'm not doing a very good job, because what you're all doing here is we're not doing this, and this is an incredible thing. I'm really impressed with what you all are doing to tackle this, the extraordinary challenge before us. I, mean, I think you're exactly right. Um, I suppose that every generation probably thinks that they're in extraordinary times. And I think that we as a civilization are always facing extraordinary challenges. I, I do think that we could reasonably agree, though, that right now we really are facing an extraordinary challenge. Um, and so I'm, I'm just so inspired by 
what you're doing, and I'm hoping to take some of this back to my own church and propose it to our own pastor, because I think that the way you've done this thoughtfully, carefully, in a um, serious way, to try to figure out exactly how you as a congregation is, how you as individuals can make a difference in, to, to, to deal with the social justice uh, problems before us is really exactly why we founded Communities United Against Hate. Um, look, this, we're a nonpartisan, we're a nonprofit organization, we're not political. But I'll tell you this, we would not have created this organization if the election had turned out differently last November. Um, and that's because we would have thought that we were in a really good place as a society. We had had eight years of the first African-American, first minority president. Um, in my mind, he had done incredible work. I worked in that administration. I thought that we as a country, we as a county, I thought we'd made incredible progress. And I think that we did. But right after the election, I think we were all shocked by the explosion of bias and hate incidents that, 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 that arrived. I mean, literally the day after. Um, and in our county, all over the country, um, you, you saw attacks on Muslims, shooting deaths of Sikh Americans who were sort of erroneously believed to be Muslims, um, bomb threats against Jewish institutions all over the country, including in our county, um, swastikas in our schools, in my children's schools. My kids go to public school. Um, one of them was at Westland. There was a swastika you know, in the bathroom at Westland, but they popped up all over the schools. We have been working with the county government and, um, and with the Office of Human Rights, which does incredible work, and they're a member of CUA, and they're telling us that literally every week at a school in the county to this day, since the last November, there has been a bias or a hate incident. So you know, we, but look, the reality is that this is a problem that was gonna be there whether Hillary wins or not. What's different is that now we know about it. And so, and what's different is that we're actually doing things you know, I don't know that you would have had the same focus in, in this forum if the election had turned out differently. We would not have founded CUA if the election had turned out differently. But the challenge would still have been there. The bias and the views that still exist among many people in our county, in our progressive, wonderful Montgomery County, um, would still have been there. Um, and that it would be true all over the country. And so in some ways, and Lisa and I were talking about it, um, in some ways, we actually can become a better society, a better county, a better, more inclusive community because of this crazy time that we're in, because we are all recognizing that the challenge before us is more serious than we thought. Um, so, you know, one of the things, at least I mentioned that I spent 15 years at the Justice Department, and, and that's right, and I, I started in the Civil Rights Division, I was a prosecutor in, in Baltimore, um, I ended up working for Director Mueller, um, you know, and I handled hate crimes at various times, and I can tell you this, we are not going to prosecute our way out of the hate crime problem. We are not going to prosecute our way out of discrimination. That is an important part of the solution set. You absolutely have to do that sort of thing. That's part of our criminal justice process. It's part of us of what we do to achieve justice. But it is not going to. It's not the solution. It is not the only solution. The, the most powerful solution is for us to organize, and for us to speak out, and to speak up against these issues. And so, a lot of what inspired us to form CUA, and we literally formed CUA, or at least what became CUA a year ago and about a week. Um, and so it was the middle of November, all this stuff was happening, and I reached out to a bunch of my friends who were deeply involved in sort of county organizing and, and different nonprofit organizations from many of the communities that are affected by this typically, whether it's African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, LGBTQ, you know, everything, right? So then, and you know, it was the Sunday after Thanksgiving and we, um, uh, and people came, you know, 15 people got together at the teachers union and we sat and I, I, brought, I pulled out this manual, this 2006 Southern Poverty Law Center manual on how to create an anti-hate coalition. And I'm sure they've updated it since then. But, you know, we had this thing, but it hasn't changed, right? And so there's like 10 steps for building an anti-hate coalition. So we went through it, and we, and we, and we all said, yeah, we, we should do all of those 10 things. And then we began thinking, well, how, how are we going to do this? What does the county need? Where, Where's the gap? What is the need? How are we going to react? It's just what you were saying earlier. How do we react to this need? Um, how do we create something that's, that isn't just duplicating what another group is doing? How do we fill? There's clearly a gap because there's a huge problem, right? Where is that gap? And then, then we spent, then we did what you all are doing, right? We spent literally five months meeting every two weeks to try to figure it out. And, and, and so um, and it culminated with this launch, and there's some materials there, um, if you get a chance to pick it up. And some of you, I think, are recognizing you were actually at our launch at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School in April. 
Uh, but it culminated with that. But what we realized is that there's hundreds of fantastic organizations out there that are doing this kind of work. Um, and the county government's actually pretty responsive. There's some areas that it could definitely work on and improve, but it's pretty responsive. Um, so we don't want to duplicate what CASA's doing, what the NAACP is doing, what the Muslim community is doing. Let's not duplicate that. Where's the need? You know, what is it that we need to do? And what we realized is that um, we all had experiences where we wanted to work across communities. We wanted to work with different communities. So like my church reaches out to the Muslim community and we do a dinner. You know, or you know, I'm in the Asian American community, and we want to do something political, so we reach out to other, you know, our minority brethren in, in other communities, right? But it's kind of ad hoc, right? And it's not systematic, and it's not sustained. Um, and so then it kind of you, you get some of that, but it's not you, you're not really getting to that point where you've got that real relationship. And so we began. We spent weeks and weeks on our mission statement. And so the mission statement is actually very intentional and it's it's very uh let's see if i can actually do this there we go so um and and, and you, you know and, and you just pick up where i am a uh, little left off so our mission is to be a nonpartisan organization that unites unites that's our main thing we were a uniter at least we're trying to be a uniter uh, a diverse community to combat bigotry support victims of hate and promote inclusiveness so what we realized is that what we needed to do was to create a platform where groups could actually unite together, where we could develop those relationships. And then we began thinking, okay, so what, how do you actually do that? It can't be top down. It's got to be organic. It's got to be ground up. You've got to create the framework, this platform where people can actually work together. So um, at some point, I'll move off my second slide and <laughs> get, get, you know, I, I won't be up here the entire time. We'll get to a conversation shortly. But, you know, so what, what is it that we needed to do? So um, we're not, an organization that does work for just one constituency. We're also not a coalition. Coalitions are groups that require all the members to reach an agreement about a particular, usually a policy, right? And so whether there's a trust act or whatever, you know, it's like, but you're all sort of agreeing, okay, this is what we're gonna do, this is what our position is, and this is how we're gonna do it. Um, and the, heart, the challenge with coalitions is that often you devolve to the lowest common denominator because it's very difficult to actually find that consensus. And if you want to have a diverse coalition, then it's extremely difficult. Because the reality is that some of these groups don't do anything on immigration. Some of these groups do everything on immigration, or they do only immigration, right? So how do you actually build this coalition? And we realized that, well, we probably shouldn't build a coalition. Groups can build coalitions using the CUA platform, but we as CUA are not a coalition. What we are is we're a network. And so, um, and what does that mean? So, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of a policy geek, and so um, I, I try to use these economic, these economic analogies, even though I'm not even an economist. And so if any of you are economists, please correct me if I'm getting this analogy wrong. But you know, our society is built on a marketplace, right? It's all about ingenuity, entrepreneurship, um, people taking initiative and trying to create a different society, whether it's you're trying to make a business um, or build a practice within a law firm. It's all about sort of what you're doing at the ground level up and then pushing it out, right? And you're trying to push yourself into the marketplace and you're trying to um, provide, you're supplying something um, and you're trying to meet a demand for a particular service or a particular product, right? So what we as cool, we're also a marketplace, but we're not a marketplace for capitalism. We're a marketplace for activism. And what we try to do is to make sure that the supply of activists and donors and groups that are looking to collaborate is meeting the demand for that. And the reality is that in this extraordinary time, there, are, there, is, a, there is now the recognition that there is a very great demand for groups to be working together because we actually have common interests and common challenges and common goals. There are differences, of course, but we need to find those commonalities and work together. And also, after that election, a lot of people were very frustrated and there's a lot of activists out there and a lot of donors and a lot of groups that are trying to step up their game and do something about this because we're realizing that we actually have a bigger challenge before us than we thought. And so we are trying to use our online platform and our in-person events to help people find that place where you, get the, you maximize your economic utility. So any of you economists, please, I'm sorry, you're probably cringing right now about these analogies, but hopefully I'm not too far off. 
If I'm off, please let me know either during the session or before or, or after. But, um, but I think it kind of works. And so, so what we're trying to do is make sure that the doctors and the lawyers and the immigration experts out there, the teachers, the, you know, the ESOL specialists are finding an opportunity to, to make the biggest impact they can as activists. But to do that, you need to know what the opportunities are. And it's really, it's, it's about relationship building. You know, we're trying to create a united community, right? That is a very significant challenge. It's hard for me to create a united family, and I've only got four people in my family. But, but the challenge in our family is communication, right? So I've got a 15-year-old, and you think, he's pretty good about communicating, but he's not great at it, you know? It's like we're constantly finding out about things that are happening in school from his teammates on his soccer team. We're driving to and from soccer, saying, thank goodness we carpool, so we actually find out what's going on in school. But it's about, but it's about communications, right? Um, and it's about building that trust, building that openness, and just knowing what's going on. Because if you know what's going on, then you can act. So like, so often, and, and part of really the thing that, that inspired me to reach out to my friends last November was that I get an email, I get a text from a friend of mine who is the head of Impact Silver Spring, which is one of our members, and it's just a fantastic organization. And I'm on the board of Impact, and she sends me this text um, and says, hey, there's going to be a press conference and a rally outside of the Christ Congregational Church on Colesville Road, Colesville and 495, because they've got this Black Lives Matter sign that was defaced, and the word black was cut out of the sign, right? So they had a press conference, and for, I mean, I, I got it that morning, and fortunately I had an open morning, so I went, right? So, um, you know, I go, and Jamie Rasson is there, and Tom Hooker is there, and Roger Berliner is there, and George Leventhal is there, and we have a bunch of elected officials, and they're great, right? And, they, and they're very progressive, and they're saying all the right things, and it's good, and there's a couple of reporters, and there's about 25 people there, right? And it's like, okay, all right, it's, it's good that they, we did this, right? But, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot more than 25 people that would have gone to this thing if they'd heard about it. And I'm sure that I wasn't the only one that heard about it that morning. Some people probably heard about it after it already took place, right? So we're just not that organized, right? And it's just like your family. You kind of, I've got to actually make efforts to get my kid to talk to me, right? It's got to be intentional. I've got to be a little bit organized about it. I've got to be a little bit strategic about like how I ask questions and when I ask questions, you know, when I can get that moment when he's actually going to talk to me about stuff, right? We kind of have to do that as a community for us to become a united community, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. So we're trying to create a communications platform and vehicle through which we can all work together and learn about the opportunities. Like it's not rocket science, all right? It is not some grand thing. It is literally, let's be talking to each other and let's find out what we're doing. Let's find out what our challenges are. Let's figure out where there's commonalities and let's, let's, let's see if we can support each other because the reality is that I care a lot about Asian American issues, but I also care about African American issues and Latino issues. I'm just generally kind of a progressive person, and everybody in Kuwait is a very progressive person. And I'm guessing that everybody in this room is pretty progressive, and you care about a lot more than just your own individual selves. That's why you're here. That's why you're doing this whole thing, right? So if you want to help other people, what's, how do you do that? Well, you know, we, we live in this, you know, I live in Kensington, and three blocks away, or, you know, there's, there's a community that has a lot of challenges, right? I don't really know what's going on in that community. It is three blocks away. I drive to and from work in my car. I drive to and from the soccer plex. You know, it's just, it, that's what I do, right? And I don't know what the heck is going on three blocks away, right? So how do you figure that out? And all we are trying to do is to help everyone figure out what is happening. So many of us, we were talking about this before, before the talk, so many of us are working on big issues. We work on national issues. Like I get every day I get all these clippings on cybersecurity and I'm working with all these companies and it's like, that's great, right? But I don't know what's happening three blocks away. So how do you figure that out? All right. So in some ways we're just like a clipping service. Okay. So let's talk about this. And so how do, how do we, how do we foster these communications? How do we people let people know? Um, okay. So first of all, these are a lot of the groups that are part of us. And so it, it is, you know, it's, 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 it was sort of extraordinary. You know, we spent all this time trying to figure out what we should do. And then I guess that we kind of figured out something that people did care about because it didn't take long at all. I mean, so this group that we started 15 people, in six months it grew to 120 people and we didn't even do outreach. It's just word of mouth. People realized that there was this thing happening. They were meeting every two weeks at MCEA and they were coming up with some ideas that were very interesting and there were really good people involved. And so good people that are effective leaders and effective organizers attract other effective leaders and effective organizers. And so this group of organizers, like we have an organizers listserv and maybe some of you may want to join an organizers listserv if you want to get a lot of emails. And you know, you, there's like 120 people on this listserv, right? And it's like, and we're always sharing ideas about things that are going on. But this is like the organizers group. We also have like a large distro list for people that just come to our events. But, but so then all these groups 
sort of started joining us. So these, are, these are actually, a lot of these groups are just simply the organizing groups. And now they're sort of officially part of our group. Um, a lot of them are not quite on our website yet because they haven't given us a logo and stuff, stuff like that. But you know, we have to work on those things. But so you'll see that there's lots of different types of groups. And so, so uh, you know, I've got a lot of friends in my law firm that are Republicans. I'm a Democrat, okay? So a lot of Republican conservative friends, right? And so we talk about these things. And, and one of the things that, um, and it's really, really helpful when I talk about this with conservatives, because we're not Democrat, we're not Republican. Um, and, you know, it's, the world is so complex now that we, none of us really just fit into a little box. I'm Asian American, but I'm a lot of other things too. Um, and everybody's a lot of things. And we just can't be confined to our boxes. And we try not to do that. And so if you see, you'll see that there's Jewish and there's different types of Christian organizations. And there's um, African American and Latino and Asian American um, and Sikh organizations and Muslim organizations um, and service groups. And you know, there's all manner of different types of institutions that are involved in trying to build this united community. You don't have to just be an African American advocacy organization. Um, Faith-based institutions have an incredibly important role in our organization. But, you know, I'd like to add my kids' soccer team. You know, let's add the Citizens Association. Let's add, you know, the Cub Scouts. I mean, just add anybody can be a part of this building of a community. You don't have to be a particular form of identity that we recognize in the census. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can think about it that way, um, but uh, that's not the way my Republican friends like to think about it. And so. So you know, we talk about it in different ways with people, but the reality is we're, create, we're creating sort of a united community, right? And so we would love for this congregation to be a part of it. And, um, and you know, we'll talk about what that actually means. It's really, um, it's really just an opportunity for you all to be more deeply involved. There's a lot of ways you can be deeply involved. My church happens to be very involved. There's different congregations and synagogues and, and uh, temples that are deeply involved. Some are not so involved. Yeah. Involved. Yeah, but minutes, so, so let me, let me, yeah, so this is taking much longer than I thought it would, sorry. Well, it's all so, fascinating. So let me, let me, so here, let me just go through the rest of so you actually see what we're doing, yeah. and then it'll be uh, more uh, Great. systematic. Okay, so, so we do this online. So originally we thought we were just going to be an online platform, okay? Um, and then we realized, we looked around and we're all in our 40s and 50s, and we realized, oh, you know what, we actually still want to get together in person. And so that may not be true for the 20 year olds, but for us, we wanted to do it, but right, but, we, but the, first, the first and foremost thing was, was to create an online platform. So one, calendar. So we have a calendar on our website and eventually it's gonna be something you can just link to on your phone, right? So then you will know what is happening. Part of the challenge right we have right now is that the groups that are members are not really feeding us information about their events. So some groups, like we have a ton of stuff from CASA because CASA is feeding us their stuff, other groups are not, right? We need to have the other groups send us their, just, just send us your newsletter, right? <laughs> but that, sometimes, sometimes communication is as simple as that. Groups are not always sending us the newsletter. Send us your newsletter. We can take. We can put that up on the calendar, right? So calendar. Um, then we have. We're really active on social media, um, and so we have. Fortunately, we have incredible professionals that are devoting their volunteer time to building this Kua platform. So we have a very active presence on Facebook. In six months, we got to like 800 likes, and we've been boosting to like 10,000 people for our events. So we really have a good presence on Facebook. And later on, I'm going to show you how you can actually like us and join us. Um, and then we have a program for reporting hate crimes and incidents. And so we have a very ra a ro robust rapid response program, whether it is rapid response because there is a vigil coming up or a rapid response because the NAACP has got an event next week or there's an actual hate incident. And if there's a hate incident, you can report incidents through our portal, through our website, um, and then it'll go to the Anti-Defamation League, which has professional staff that deals with stuff. You can also report it to the Attorney General's hotline, the State Attorney General, that is. And then the... Um, and then you can also report it to the Montgomery County Police Department. So that is our online program. We also do, did three really wonderful events. Um, our, our volunteers and our organizers are incredible. We did the launch at BCC High School. Um, the in-person piece is incredibly important because people still need to interact. And it's still an important way that we actually work together and collaborate. And so what we're all about is activism and helping people to find their place, right? So our launch, and I, in my mind, reflected that. So I think some of you that went to the launch, we had about 600 people there. Brian Frost gave a great keynote. We had a panel of diverse leaders that talked about the challenges before us. But the most important thing is we had a volunteer fair. And about 300 people went to that volunteer fair. And there were about 55 organizations that were there. And they all signed up volunteers. And that was wonderful. And they were groups from, they were all those groups plus many, many more. And, they, and, and this was a way that people could actually do something right away. 
And so that was our launch. Then we did two schools conferences. Um, and the schools are incredibly important because we are the 17th largest school district out of about 15,000 in the United States. Um, the, uh, let's see. Uh, we, last year, our school population grew to such an extent that it reflected 40% of the population growth in schools in the entire state. Uh, we have students from more than 157 countries that speak 138 languages in their homes. Um, and we're among the top 20 US school districts with the highest concentration of English language learners. So we're not talking about the schools in Chevy Chase. Let's be real here, all right? We're talking about the schools in Tacoma Park, in Gaithersburg, in Silver Spring. Our county is incredibly diverse, but we don't always know what is going on in other parts of the county. Um, and so the schools are so important. It's not the only thing that we do as COA, but it is a very, very important part because um, it, it's, it's an opportunity. It, it, the, the diversity of the school system, uh, the complexity of the schools, it creates uniquely important challenges, but also uniquely important opportunities to build the organized community, united community that we are trying, that we're striving for. And so um, very diverse. Uh, let's see, so if you look at the demographics, we are majority minority by a big margin. It's about 29% white, 30% Latino, 22% African American, 14% Asian American, and the diversity is growing. So if you look at this, this is the timeline from 1970 to today, and you can just see that the diversity is increasing at an at a increasing rate. Um, um, and with that diversity comes economic challenges. And so uh, it is the case uh, that um, <clears throat> 35% of the students in our school system receive free and reduced meals, 16% are in ESOL, and 11% receive specialized services. So with these de demographics, the school environment is one of the best places for us to find opportunities to work together across racial, ethnic, and religious lines to unite our communities. And so we did these two schools conferences last October. Thank you to some of you that went. Um, we had about 200 people that came to these conferences. One was on a Saturday, one was on a Sunday to try to get you know, different communities. Um, there were, I've got some materials here. I don't have a lot of them, but you, you can certainly keep them. You can just peruse it. But there's um, um, our program from our first conference on October 7th, not the one from October 22nd, but it reflects what we were trying to do. We had, we had lots of terrific national, state, and local leaders um, that address anti-bullying initiatives, initiatives to address hate and bias, student and parent capacity building, and the student achievement gap. And we had really meaningful conversations. And there were all sorts of connections happening across different communities. There were really sort of extraordinary in some ways, but also just incredibly mundane. It's like, oh, wow, your community's also doing that? Oh, you're advocating for curricular change? Um, and this is like the woman in Damascus talking to the woman from the CASA. You know, it's like, these are not communities that would have otherwise talked, OK? And suddenly, they're finding it. They're pushing for the same sort of thing. And if they work together, maybe they're going to get that curricular change faster and more completely. Um, and it's going to cover a broader range of issues than if they didn't meet there. Um, so there's all these sort of all these collaborations and all these connections that are happening, and it was really exciting. But also just, you know, it's just communications. It's just about relationship building. So one of the things that we're really excited about, and there's a handout for this, is our Yelp initiative. And I'm not sure it's going to continue to be called Yelp, because of course there's a Yelp thing online. But it is the Youth Engagement and Leadership um, per, uh, Project Initiative. So we had about seven high school students do presentations at our conferences. We devoted three out of the like, 10 workshops to student presentations. And there was like the Seek Kid to Kid program where they're educating people, you know, classmates, teachers, administrators about Sikhism. There's tremendous ignorance about Sikhism. And frankly, I, I knew very little about Sikhism before this. I'm still relatively ignorant, but I've learned a lot. You know, And it's like, it's just, they, they built this thing, and it was really inspiring. There's the kid at BCC that created this high school success project. And so he, he's working with kids that are not native English speakers and helping them not only to navigate, to learn, to, to sort of not only tutoring them in school, but also helping them to navigate the craziness of the administration that's required, that the school that requires people to, to, to do. I mean, to, to join a club, you've got to fill out all these forms. They don't necessarily know how to do that or know even to do it. And so he helps to do this. And it was, it's very successful. Um, there's the, uh, the high school junior at Walter Johnson that has this Muslim interfaith outreach project. 
There was the folks at Blair that created the Black Hat Project. These, they, they were the ones that organized the students that, that marched all the way downtown uh, during school hours uh, to protest Trump's uh, sort of inauguration. So, you know, and so they, they put this out there, and there's a lot about how students organize and why they did it and what an impact it made. And what we realized, what we adults realized is like, wow, peer counseling, peer education, peer support, peer advocacy is an incredibly important part of the solution set. Um, and it may be the most important part of the solution set. So how do we flash that? How do we help expand the programs that do work to other schools? How do we inspire more kids to actually create more projects like this? How do we get the youth group of the St. John's Episcopal Church to actually pick up one of these things and apply for a grant? And so what we realize is that there's a couple things that students needed. One, a little bit of grant money, like a little micro grant, $500, $750 to cover a little bit of food, pizza, copy costs. You know, it turns, out that it turns out that students actually have to spend money to reserve rooms in schools. It's crazy, right? Um, so, but a little bit of money might help, right? Um, give them an, a mentor, a teacher, a paraeducator, a community leader that can mentor them. More importantly, maybe give them a student mentor, somebody, one of these persons that ran a successful project that's a senior that has, been, has figured out the system and knows how to work it. Give them a mentor. Do it in their school. Um, and then. And then let's have a fair. So let's, let's not just have a science fair. Look, look, I'm a science geek. I studied intellectual engineering in college. I, I've been to science fairs. Science fairs are great, but you know what? We need a social change fair. Because let's not just reward the science students for the great work that they're doing with their experiments and their results. Let's reward the kids that are actually organizing and creating social change. So let's have an affair, let's have an affair where you've got tables of students that are presenting their work. And let's recognize the ones that are particularly effective. Let's, I reckon, let's give them a chance to present to the larger audience. Maybe we can give them an award. But let's, let's focus on this. Let's inspire students. Let's remove the obstacles to, to students doing this sort of social change. So that is our project. We're actually doing an organizing kickoff this afternoon. You all are welcome to come. There's information about it on the one pager. Um, but you know, the, the teacher union, the county council of PTAs, which is like the umbrella group for all the PTAs, the Montgomery County Regional Student Government Association, which is the umbrella group for all the student government associations, and CUA are organizing this thing. And today, we're going to be working with the NAACP and CASA and the county government and all these, and the Muslim community and the Sikh community to actually bring all the stakeholders together to make this thing work, get their input, and, and hopefully we can launch this thing together um, as a community. So, so this is the Youth Engagement Project. So, that's, that's where we're going. Um, I really appreciate uh, you having me. I think that's basically all that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I think that what you're all doing is incredible, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. And I think we'll dispense with the conversation because we have about 10 minutes, and I want to be sure that people in the audience will have a chance okay. to ask So you. I'm sorry that that, that took so long. Yes, but it was an incredible amount of wonderful information, and okay. I thank you very much for that. Let me turn to you and give you a, a chance to ask Paul questions about this initiative. Talk right into the mic because it won't record otherwise. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The best way to uh, to engage um, uh, and and to find out what the activities are. So the rallies and stuff is through your website. Yeah, that's, that's one way you can do it. So okay. the website is one, but then two, you may want to join our listserv, uh, okay. to the organizers listserv. And, and you then, do just do that through your website? Or, uh, or, yeah, or, but even though that's a little bit different, I can just add you to okay. that. So I can, whoever you want to designate to be sort of the point person for COA, just let, it, it could be multiple people. Okay. Uh, but then also, get it, there's these different, pro, I mean, we have projects and things like that. And so what is, when you join the listserv, you'll find about find out about these projects and you know getting involved in Yelp, getting involved in some of the trainings that we're going to organize this year. Um, that's that those are all meaningful ways you can do stuff. Okay. But then but then getting but getting the action alerts. So if you if you if you sign up um, if you register on the website, then you can get as just like individual, then you can get our action alerts. And we put those out once every couple of weeks or so as things are happening, right? And so that is the way that you'll get it proactively. Um, the calendar isn't great right now because groups aren't really sending us much stuff. Hopefully over the next six months, we're going to be getting groups to actually do that. So we have a concerted effort to do that. But yeah, that's, that's basically it. I think one of the reasons so many groups have gotten involved with KUA is because there's a hunger for information about what's out there, how to get involved. And that's the service you're providing. Yeah. Um. Hi. So who is the point person, say, if 
a school, like my daughter's school wants mm -hmm. to join, right? Or her Girl Scout troop wants to join. Who is that point person that they need to speak to in order to join you? It's, it's our vice president of membership. Her name is Heather Moran. She's actually the executive director of the Sixth and I Historic Synagogue. Okay. And she and I, she's the membership person. Heather Moran? Heather Moran. Okay. Yeah, Thank so, you. Uh, information is here. Uh, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send her your email address, but yeah. Okay, thank and you. You can always reach me too, but Heather is, our, is the one that will make okay. everything happen. Okay, great. So you said your, um, your, your list service will, will post if there is a report of, a, of an incident of a hate crime, a hate incident. Uh, well, so you can report it to us through the website. Right. And if you're on the listserv, you can report, you can just sort of let the organizers know as well. Um, so there's a variety, but the, the sort of the official way to do it, it would be through our website. So my question is, suppose somebody reports a hate incident, what does KUA do about that? So it depends on what it is, right? So what we'll do is we'll reach out, we'll reach back to the person to find out more about it. Now, hate, if it really is a, a hate crime or a bias incident, it's tricky because you've got victims, right? And some victims um, just want assistance, right? Some victims, especially if they're institutions, they may want to do an event like a, a rally or a press conference or something like that. Um, and so you've got to find out exactly what it is that they need. And so we'll do an initial call or contact to that person that reported it and find out what it is that they're, um, you know, what happened and what it is that they need. Um, and so uh, if they need professional help, and if it really is an individual victim, we're gonna put them in touch with professionals, meaning the, the, the Montgomery County Police, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, and they are very good at that sort of thing. Um, and then we also have all these different member organizations, some of which this victim or this individual report you know, person um, may want to talk to. So they will invite that person to contact those groups and we will send them information on how they can actually do that. But it, it's, it's, it's something that requires a lot of sensitivity because sometimes it's a very, very personal violation. Paul, sorry, I have oh, the mic. Sorry. Hold on, Alex. John has got the microphone, um, so we'll, we'll let her go. <laughs> yeah, but it's a quick question, though. Um, do you find that some of your member groups are now forming their own um, initiatives together? Like, is that, yeah, is that something yeah, you're hoping exactly, is going to yeah, happen more? Exactly, of? exactly. Yeah. So we want people to be able to use us as a platform to work together and identify each other. But yeah, I mean, so. So like um, Heather, who's the head of Six and I, they, they wanted to have a speaker come, you know, a, a DACA recipient speak to their synagogue, right? Right after Trump made a decision to sort of end the program. So um, thanks to Kua, she knew to reach out to Gustavo Torres. So in just a call, she was able to call Gustavo Torres and Gustavo is the head of CASA and they have a lot of dreamers and DACA recipients that are, um, you know, that are wonderful speakers that want to speak, that are comfortable speaking. And so within a week she had somebody that was speaking to Sixth and I, right? So th that's just one small example of how it is that we sort of link up people together. Um, and um, yeah, and that's exactly the idea. And then sometimes, we'll, you know, there's ways that we as an organization can publicize their efforts. So if they're gonna have an event, um, then we, if they let us know, then we can actually put it out on an action alert, or put it on the calendar, put it on our Facebook, and so on. Paul, before you take the next question, maybe you could tell them what you told me about the transgender student and how Kula was able to help in that. Yeah, so, so we had, so, um, uh, a teacher from Bullis, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have identified the school. Um, anyway, so the teacher from that private school came to our Kula Schools Conference and, um, and we talked and, um, and she went to one of the panels on sort of where a terrific LGBTQ student activist um, did a presentation, right? <clears throat> and she learned about some resources that MCPS has on transgender sort of issues and how to communicate with students and how to build an environment where uh, they can be, um, feel more welcome, right? Um, and so, um, so then she, she, she's a teacher at the school and she realizes that, oh, well, you know, um, there's actually a transgender elementary student and the school is trying to figure out how to actually manage the situation. And I think they didn't have a lot of resources and they didn't have a lot of know-how in the area. So she actually said, oh, you know, I, I remember that MCPS has done a lot of thinking on this and they're pretty advanced on it. And so, um, so she just literally went to the website, pulled down the materials, and they end up using that. She, she tells me the other day, we're at some BC, it's so random. It's like, it's, it's the random encounters that make you feel like you're actually part of a community. So I ended up sitting next to her at the recent BCC high school sort of musical, right? 
And it was just totally random. And we're sitting next to her, and it's like, and initially I didn't, even I didn't even recognize her, right? And then she turns to me and says, well, you're the cool guy, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And you're the, you're the teacher from the private school. And she said, oh, well, guess what? We had this issue. And like, they ended up using the MCPS materials, and, and she said it was a lot better, and that things actually, she actually felt good about how they handled it because of that. And so, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science, but you know what? Those things help. It's the connections. It's, it's the, the connections. Network. It's the network. It's the relationship. It's the communication. Sorry. Go Alex ahead. has a question, and I don't want to. Um, how do you incorporate organizations whose missions are somewhat different than your mission? So, for instance, I saw that one of your member organizations is a wider circle. Now, they have a very different focus. Right. And so I'm just curious as to how, how do you uh, get, what, do, what can they contribute and how do you get them involved? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that um, it's interesting. We had our retreat yesterday and we were talking about what it is that different types of institutions and different types of individuals can get out of COA. And it's really varied, right? And we're trying to create structure that allows people to find their place and find a way to collaborate. So I talked to Mark the other day because we, uh, he, my church actually has a very close relationship with Mark Brigell and a wider circle. We do an event for them every year um, around this time. And so he gives a talk at our church every year. And if you haven't had Mark Brigell speak here, you really should. Mark is an incredibly inspiring person and a wider circle does amazing work. But there, he's actually part of this leadership group for the, for the DMV, for the, the entire area, um, on sort of addressing racial justice issues. So we're gonna work together on that. And they have been very supportive um, by publicizing some of our events. So like some groups, can get more out of KUA than others, right? Others look for ways and other look for other ways to, to, to be involved. And so look at a faith-based institution. Look, you're not like um, you're not a racial minority advocacy group. Okay? So much of what happens at faith-based institutions are not about racial justice issues. Maybe this particular collection of folks is. But you know, I, I know what happens in my church. I see the bulletin every week and it's like, all right, there's like the supper club and there's the mahjong club and there's the, you know, there's all these things, right? And so it's like, you know, it's not, that's not, um, a lot of that isn't about racial justice and that's okay. It's just about sort of building this, the, the community within that institution, right? But there's a number, but our church has been incredibly helpful and supportive of KUA. We have, they have hosted events there. Um, they're publicizing all of our activities. The people have been coming to our, you know, to, to, the, to the launch and to the schools committee, uh, to the schools conferences. Um, our pastor connected us up with the Silver Spring United Methodist Church, and so we had our first conference, first schools conference there. That was incredibly helpful. They actually donated the space for us. So there's lots of ways that, that institutions can, can support it. Um, even if they aren't an advocacy organization per se, and even if this isn't the only thing that they do. That's what you're really all about, is those, making those connections, and you never know where a connection is going to result in an action. That's right. Or, or where you can address a problem, right? Right. And so you might have an event where you do actually address it. So like, we, have, we, have, we have publicized and supported lots of rallies at churches. So some of the Unitarian churches have done a lot of rallies in response to Charlottesville and things like that. Some of you may have gone to some of those events. Um, we publicize those things in an action list. So they leverage KUA to try to get people to come, and that was good for their church, but also good for the entire community. So those are some of the ways that groups that are not sort of social, pure social justice groups can actually do things. Well, before we close, and in the interest of, you know, emphasizing again that it's getting involved, it's action, I'd just like to read something from uh, Clarissa Piccola Este's piece that launched this entire forum this fall. She said in that piece that ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another will help immensely. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, and continuing. And we know that it doesn't take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group of people who will not give up. And it seems to me Kua represents exactly that. So it seems thank to me you. that all of you represent exactly that. So we're looking forward to working with you and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.